Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a, a couple moments. Um, people are still filing in from the waiting room. Hi, everybody. Again, we're going to get started in just a couple moments. People are still coming in from the waiting room. Mahalo. All right, with that, we're going to turn it over to Karen Ireland. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our fifth webinar on the Care and Choices at the End of Life, um, Hawaii's Our Care, Our Choice Act. Today, we'll be talking about really the considerations for clinical practice, um, focusing a lot on the role of the independent practitioner, as well as having Laura Arcival join us from the Department of Health with an update on the first two years of the law. We are eligible to have continuing education credits as a part of this webinar. So I am going to read some information that is an obligation to us to make sure that everyone is aware of the rules about the continuing education. So just hold with me here and we'll get going on the webinar. So this is for the continuing education for the Care and Choices at the End of Life an educational series on the Hawaii Our Care Our Choice Act. In support of improving patient care, this activity has been planned and implemented by Hawaii Pacific Health and Compassion and Choices, Hawaii American Nurses Association, and NASW chapter, Hawaii chapter. Hawaii Pacific Health is jointly accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, and the American Nurses Credentialing Center to provide continuing education for the healthcare team. Hawaii Pacific Health designates this live webinar for a maximum of 1.5 AMA PRA Category 1 credits for physicians. Physicians should only claim credit commensurate with the extent of their participation in the activity. Hawaii Pacific Health designates this live webinar for 1.5 contact hours for nurses. Hawaii Pacific Health is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, ACPE, as a provider of continuing pharmacy education. This activity is accredited for 1.5 contact hours for attendance at the entire CE session. For ACE, as a jointly accredited organization, Hawaii Pacific Health is approved to offer social work continuing education by the Association of Social Work Boards, the ASWB, approved continuing education program. Organizations, not individual courses, are approved under this program. State and provincial regulatory boards have the final authority to determine whether an individual course may be accepted for continuing education credit. Hawaii Pacific Health maintains responsibility for this course. Social workers completing this course will receive 1.5 continuing education credits. For the American Psychological Association, Hawaii Pacific Health is accredited by the American Psychological Association and designates this live activity for 1.5 continuing education credits. Continuing education credits for psychologists are provided through the co-sponsorship of the American Psychological Association, APA, Office of Continuing Education in Psychology, CEP. Hawaii Pacific Health maintains responsibility for the content of the programs. In order to claim continuing education credit, please note that in order to receive the continuing edu education credits for this offering, you must claim credit commensurate with the extent of your participation in the activity, complete and submit the evaluation survey that will be emailed to you within one week of the offering, um, speakers cannot claim credit for their own presentations and your continuing education certificate will be immediately available to you upon completion of your evaluation. Thank you very much. And that's the lengthy um, requirements and we can move on to the next slide. Okay, just to, um, to ask a question, you can put it into the Q&A box at any time. 
Um, we will be doing questions and answers at the end. So if you see that your question's just sitting there, we will definitely get to it by the end of the webinar today. And then next slide, um, we are recording. You will not be on camera, so don't worry about that. Um, and this will be available after today's webinar that we can share out as well. Okay, our speakers today. We actually have um, a little change in our speakers, but we're expecting all of them plus a couple of extras. So Dr. David Grove, the Medical Director of Compassion and Choices will be joining us. He unfortunately is currently testifying um, at the Oregon legislature. Um, so he, he will be, we are, are, have the, the honor of having Dr. Um, Chuck Miller joining us from Kaiser to also speak about um, medical aid and dying. Laura Arcibald, the Department of Health is here and she is our state, uh, Hawaii State Telehealth and Healthcare Access Coordinator. And Dr. Char Sharfin is our emergency room pro uh, provider on the Big Island, as well as a physician who has worked a lot with medical aid and dying. Thank you all for joining us today. So let's talk, let me tell you a little about, a, about Compassion and Choices. I am a consultant working with them now for the last couple of years. It's been a pleasure to work with them. And the Compassion and Choices really focuses to improve care, expand option, and empowers everyone to chart their end of life journey. Compassion and Choices is the nation's oldest, largest, and most active nonprofit working to improve care expand options and empower everyone to chart their end of life journey. Since 1980, Compassion and Choices has united over 450,000 supporters nationwide to become the preeminent leader of the end of life movement. Next slide. So who's here today? Christina, can you help us identify who's here today? You have a poll in front of you. If you can just let us know what your role is, that would be fabulous. It helps us better understand who our audience is. So take a quick minute and select your profession. Okay, what are our results? Oh, it's a great mix of people in our audience today, physicians, nurses, Looks like we have a number of um, oh, equal amounts of physicians, nurses, and a little bit more psychologists. Um, thank you all for joining us. Next slide. So our objectives today. Our focus is really to review the clinical competencies in participating in medical aid and dying and the requirements of the law. We want to make always make sure that people have the basics of what the law is really all about. We are having an update from the Hawaii Department of Health on OCOCA for the first two years. So we're really excited to see this new data um, and, and the analysis that's been done um, by the Department of Health about the use of the law. We'll be examining the unique role of independent physicians and practitioners in medical aid and dying. Um, we know that there are large systems that have been helping patients, but we also know that there are individual docs who may have some different resources that they tap into to really help meet those needs. And lastly, to really ex examine that team-based approach um, in patient-centered care. Next slide. So where do we start? So Dr. Miller, can you help us with a little base in medical aid and dying? Oh, you're muted, Dr. Miller. You, thank you. There. Now, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so let's start at the beginning. The uh, beginning of the requirements of the law is the patient has to make an initial oral or verbal request to the attending physician and the attending physician is the physician who will write the prescription. Um, most of the time, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, the setting uh, for most of my patients and I've seen probably close to 80 patients now, uh, 
the setting is usually in relationship to uh, their disease progressing in spite of uh, everything that medical science can provide. And then, um, can you go back to the first slide, please? Okay, I guess not. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, it's in the setting of uh, disease progression and they know the patient will, knows they're gonna die and they wanna have control of how, when, and where, and with whom they die. A um, Couple of other things, the unexpected is usually something that the patient doesn't anticipate about the, the law and that specifically, many times they don't, I gotta wait 20 days. Well, unless they have done some reading, they may not know that. And then as the physician who is evaluating them, you need to have, a, you need to make a clinical judgment. Do you think the patient will actually live the 20 day waiting period? And the other thing is uh, most patients don't have any physical barriers, uh, but some do, specifically neurologic uh, ALS patients, some of the Parkinsonism patients and patients with uh, head and neck cancer may have difficulty swallowing. Next slide. So what do you do as the provider when you get that first request for medical aid in dying? Well, you, you need to be ready within your own mind and understand uh, how you personally feel about aid in dying. Uh, and it's perfectly fine. Uh, there, there's no requirement for a physician, nurse, or any other provider to participate um, in the aid and dying process. But you need to have that in your brain before you take a request. So I put up there three things. Listen, listen, and listen. That's the most important thing you can do. <clears throat> when you are evaluating a patient's request for aid and dying. You need to find out why they're doing it. What are their, what are their deep down concerns? What are their fears? And usually they're, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, almost no patient requests aid and dying to control pain. They request it to have control over their end of life. And that's the most important thing we've found. I've not had a patient who has not discussed their decisions with their family. Um, and the last bullet down there, <clears throat> as I said before, no, no provider is, is forced to participate, but even though the law doesn't require it, I think Providers who do not want to participate in aid and dying, when their patient uh, asks them for it, uh, I think they should have a moral obligation to refer that patient to a provider who will uh, uh, allow them to participate in the law. Next slide. Okay, what is it? Medical aid in dying is a medical practice. You have to be a mentally capable adult with a prognosis of six months or less to live. And <clears throat> normally this also requires a terminal illness. We can talk about that later, but um, if you meet those requirements, you may request in Hawaii and nine other jurisdictions in the country, you may request the doctor's prescription for medication to end your life. And uh, the medical, the medical aid in dying has well-published standards of practice and clinical practice guidelines. They've been published for six or seven years now. And um, it is a very well accepted and uh, well understood uh, procedure. Next slide. 
So the eligibility requirements talked a little bit earlier. <clears throat> These are specifically for uh, Hawaii. You have to be an adult. You have to be a resident of the state. You have to be terminally ill and prognosis of six months or less. The only thing I can say about that, um, that's more art than science. And, um, you know, I can look at a patient and I can review their records and I can evaluate them and I can say based on my clinical judgment, yeah, I think Mrs. Jones, you meet the requirements of six months or less prognosis. And Mrs. Jones may live another 18 months. So it's what I'm saying is more art than science. They have to be mentally capable of making an informed medical decision and specifically how to understand, uh, to have the capacity to understand that choosing aid in dying and what that means, what will happen. And then you talk about the, the, the able to self ingest. Next slide. So medical aid in dying is just one of many options for end of life care. And these are, I mean, they're fairly straightforward. I mean, a patient can continue all treatments uh, or they can stop all the treatments that could prolong their lives. And that is purely and totally their choice. Um, they can uh, go into palliative care where they have a team, a palliative care team that will try and provide them maximum comfort and care uh, as they're uh, at their end of life. And um, hospice care, palliative care is really part of hospice care or hospice care is part of palliative care. They're all working together as teams to provide um, at maximum comfort for a patient as they're dying. The, the uh, comfort care is all, again, that's all part provided in hospice and palliation. Uh, there is a thing called end of life doulas who are not uh, health uh, providers, but they do have experience and they will help the patient and the family uh, at the very end of their lives. We talked about stopping treatment. There is a there is a another thing you can do for re, re, totally refractory symptoms, not necessarily always pain, but something that the patient just can't tolerate. They they want they can't even lie still in bed, and that's called palliative sedation, and it requires intravenous, usually morphine, and you sedate the patient to the point that they become unconscious and uh, eventually stop breathing. VSED, voluntary stopping eating and drinking uh, is legal in every state and any patient can choose this as an option to end their life. Uh, the reason I don't recommend it to patients is it can be uh, pretty uncomfortable. Stopping eating is usually not a big deal because the patients have lost their appetite, most of them by then if they have cancer. Stopping drinking is a little more difficult, but the, the worst part of VSED from my perspective is it can take from four to eight days. And I don't think anybody um, wants to uh, be miserable for that period of time. And then medical aid in dying is the best option, at least in my opinion. <clears throat> Next slide. So we went over this a little bit. Um, the diagnosis, 80% of the diagnosis in the patients that we've seen have been cancer. Uh, the others have been end-stage uh, cardiac and end-stage pulmonary disease uh, and end-stage neurologic disease. That makes up the other 20%. Um, <clears throat> the law doesn't require the patient to be on hospice, but we strongly recommend every patient who chooses aid and dying should be on hospice when they are they take the medication. And we talked earlier about the 20 day survivability. Uh, just to expand on that a bit, out of uh, all of the patients that I've seen through the Kaiser system, fully 30% of them did not survive 
the 20 day waiting period. And we, uh, we had legislation that was trying to um, fix that. Mental capacity requires evaluation by a licensed clinical social worker, clinical psychologist, or a psychiatrist. And part of the, uh, part of the, the law, the, the requirement is that uh, there can be no evidence of coercion. And that's usually fairly obvious that these patients are requesting this because they want it themselves. Okay, next slide. All right, <clears throat> so we talked about the first oral request. And then what I say to the patient is, okay, we're gonna have another conversation. <sighs> 20 to 21 days from this first meeting. And I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to, I, the law requires that I ask you again, Mrs. Jones, do you want to continue with the aid and dying process? And I haven't had anyone say no. So <clears throat> then you have to refer the patient to a consulting physician who's really, their job is to say, review the chart, review the patient, and say, yes, I agree with Dr. Miller's assessment that this patient meets the requirements to use the medical aid and dying law. And then <clears throat> the patient also has to have a written request sent in to, uh, to the healthcare system. And it has to be signed by two witnesses. Um, one can be a, 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 a kin, but one must be unrelated. Next slide. We've gone over uh, basically most of this already. When I <clears throat> start seeing a patient as the attending, obviously I review the charts, evaluate the patient, and could basically confirm that they do indeed meet the requirements. I document it in the medical records and also uh, document uh, those, the forms that are required by the state of Hawaii. And all of that is part of the compliance process to uh, comply with the law. And then after all those <clears throat> things have been completed, I can prescribe the medication and usually is within 21 or 22 days after the first verbal request. Next slide. We talked about the consulting physician. The, the psychiatrist, psychologist, or LCLSW, they again, all their job is, is to make sure the patient has the capacity to make this medical decision that they want to end their life with medical aid and die. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, now that we have a really good base of the requirements of the law, we're going to have Laura Arcival join us from the Department of Health to help us better understand what the data looks like for the first two years. But before we do that, I think we have a poll coming up. Next slide. So we have a question for you. Although the law is statewide, which islands have the Our Care, Our Choice Act patients lived on? And Christina, here are the um, options. Please select your Answers, they are multiple choice. So which islands do you know or believe that the patients have been on, lived on? I'll just take another 10 seconds. Okay, what's our response, Christina? Okay, so this is great. Um, so most OCOCA patients have lived on Oahu. You can go to the next slide. Uh, but over the last 18 months, we've also seen patients on Kauai, Maui, Lanai, Molokai, and the Big Island um, that have been able to access the law. So we're really excited that over the whole two years now, we've really seen that access grow. Um, but as you'll see in a little bit, um, we still have a ways to go to really make sure that this is a law that is available to all of our residents. Um, so having said that, next slide, let me introduce uh, Laura Arcival from the Department of Health. Next slide. <clears throat> 
Aloha everyone and mahalo for having me again to present on behalf of the Department of Health. Our role is really to collect and report on the data for medical aid in dying um, to Hawaii's legislature. It's mm -hmm. due every year on July 1, uh, on or before July 1. Um, the data that we do collect is on the patients who received a prescription. Um, so my slides are gonna be covering um, an update on the data. I'm gonna share trends and then also highlight the forms and tools that are utilized to um, assist providers in documenting the requirements under the law and then provide the recommendations for the 2020 report that is not yet filed, but I, it, it's gonna remain the same. Um, so this is a summary slide of the two years uh, of data of patients who have received a prescription, um, 67 total for 2019 and 2020. For the year 2020, we've got 37 um, of that, a, a total of for two years, 39 ingested. Uh, for 2020, it's 24 ingested out of the 31 patients who have passed. Um, and then the average number of days, uh, I've been tracking this mainly because of um, hearing from the providers and the patients in terms of the length of time it takes um, for patients to go through the process. Um, and so this is from the first oral request to the time they receive a prescription. So in 2019, it's 35 days on average and then 45 days in 2020. Um, as what Dr. Miller mentioned, um, we are seeing also the majority of patients uh, on the data, um, their underlying illness is cancer or some form of cancer. The majority of patients are over the age of 65, have private insurance and are white and male. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is the data that is captured by Kaiser and Hawaii Pacific Health. So this is the data that we do not collect. Um, I think what's important to note here is that um, this reflects really the patient demand. Uh, you could see that it's more than twice as much. So for um, two years, 67 qualified, that's the data that we collected. But in terms of patients requesting medical aid and dying, there are about 143 referrals um, out of the prescriptions that were written. So, you know, that's like, more than twice. Um, and I believe the 37 ingested, is that from 2020? Okay. That's both years. All for both years. Um, if you go back the slide, I think that's 2020. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, about both years. So that there might be some discrepancy there in terms of the numbers um, ingested for both years. So you were right, both years. Okay, next two slides. Okay. Uh, this is just some of the things that I've been uh, noticing in terms of the data. Um, you know, access still remains a challenge for patients, especially on the neighbor islands. Um, and I will show that, that access slide um, coming up. Um, the final attestation form is a form that is primarily kept with the provider. Um, if it's available, sure, go ahead and send it to the Department of Health, but it's not really required to be sent to the Department of Health. It's one of the forms that's not required. Um, in terms of all the forms, and we'll get to the timeline slide in a minute, um, the majority of forms, or just about all of the forms, are reported in one report. And so all the forms are coming in at one time as opposed to piecemeal. So I've had some providers send in forms as they get them, <laughs> but we don't want them like that because of the filing and, you know, and so forth. So report one is just about all the forms with the exception of the follow-up form. And that would be report two. Um, and we've had number four is the underlying illness on death certificate, that's really important. Um, that's based on the law uh, that the underlying illness is indicated on the death certificate. There's been a few times where I've had um, other descriptions and thank goodness our vital records office have uh, contacted us so that we could um, talk with the physician 
um, on the neighbor islands to indicate that it should be the underlying um, illness and then they'll make the change. Next slide, please. Um, we are encouraging providers to network and come together, attend these trainings. These are very helpful on the Our Care, Our Choice process. Um, we do have a resource on the Department of Health's website where you could access the forms and um, have information about the Our Care, Our Choice Act. Um, one thing that's unique, and I think this still remains the same, is that the depart um, Hawaii is still the only state that requires a third um, evaluation, which is the mental health evaluation. Um, I've had providers say, oh, you know, they don't need to do the mental health evaluation. I said, well, that's what makes Hawaii unique. <laughs> we do need to have the mental health evaluation. Um, the, uh, and this is new. This is something that was brought to our attention during this past legislature. Um, I did run it past our de deputy attorney general. And basically what it means is that if you have a patient that uh, connects with a provider who opts not to participate in uh, medical aid and dying, uh, if that provider refers uh, that patient to another provider who's participating, that or request can be documented, that first or request with that first provider can be documented on the attending provider's form. I hope that makes sense. And that I think would help with in terms of the, uh, the timeline uh, and waiting uh, period and, and so forth um, and help expedite uh, the patients. Cause we do know that there are patients um, looking for providers and they'll continue that process until they actually get a provider that's gonna participate. However, in that process of them finding a participating provider, they've already made their oral requests a number of times probably. Next slide. Uh, this is a slide along with the next one um, to demonstrate basically patient access uh, in relation to the number of providers that are available on the neighbor islands. Um, and so this number in the table are the number of providers that are participating. So um, they're basically the same for 2019 and 2020 with the exception that in 2020, there was an increase in consulting providers. So it seems as if providers are more sort of have an affinity towards serving as a consulting provider as opposed to an attending provider. Um, but it does tell the department that there are at least potentially that many uh, attending providers or consulting providers could serve as an attending provider on the island. Um, and Kauai, uh, you could see there, it hasn't really changed. There's, there's really no attending providers on Kauai or mental health providers. So um, there are ways in which um, I believe it's uh, Kaiser and Hawaii Pacific Health have been working within their network to provide access to Kauai. Uh, next slide. Again, so the numbers increased in 2020 around consulting providers. Um, next slide. Uh, for our recommendations for 2019 and 2020, it'll remain the same in terms of waiving the waiting period if the attending provider and consulting provider agree that the patient death is likely prior to the end of the waiting period. And then also um, uh, recognizing that access, as I shown in the two tables, that access is limited especially on the neighbor islands and that we recommend authorizing advanced practice nurses to serve as attending providers for patients seeking medical aid and dying. Next slide. Okay, what is not in the DOH report, I will emphasize this mainly for um, patient access. Um, we, we could see from the other slides that patient demand is high um, so the number of patients 
who died during the process from the first oral request to before receiving a prescription, uh, that number is not in the DOH report. Um, that is collected with the providers. Um, patients that are ineligible and also the total number of patients accessing me. So the Department of Health, if you look at the report, it's only uh, on patients who received a prescription. These are patients who completed the process. So the numbers are much lower than patients who are accessing the law or at least attempting to access the law. Next slide. Okay, I'll go into the forms in the next few slides, but I wanna highlight that the importance of the forms, um, the forms were vetted by the board um, and they're designed to guide the provider and the patient in answering all the questions and ensuring that we capture the requirements um, according to the law. It helps the providers document the process, uh, helps the patient as well. Um, and then it collects the data that's reportable annually uh, to the legislature um, every year. For example, so we'll go into the attending provider. Uh, I'm sorry, the timeline. Next slide. Okay, so this is a, I've been told this is a great tool for providers to um, use uh, in terms of what's happening at each step of the process. Um, and the sort of activities that occur within these timeframes from the time of the oral request um, to writing the prescription. So I'd highly recommend taking a look at this, this form. And also it provides a list of the required forms. Um, one through four is reported. Um, once the prescription is written within 30 calendar days to the Department of Health. Um, if collected, number five can be sent, but it's not necessarily required to be submitted to the department. And then report number two is number six, the attending physician follow-up form that's reported. Um, once the attending provider is notified that the patient has passed, um, then the attending provider will collect uh, the data um, that, um, and this basically collects if whether the patient ingested or not, um, and some other data on the patient, education, race, and age, and so forth. Um, but I would take a look at this. Uh, this has been helpful for providers in knowing what the process is from, from start to end. Next slide. Uh, starting with the attending physician report, uh, I believe it's the next slide. Or is this to demonstrate the list? So this is the a list. list. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, so that was the list of forms um, and you could access the forms on the department's website. Um, starting first for the attending physician, the attending physician basically captures um, pretty much all the data in, in, in relation to the first oral request, the second oral request, the patient's written request, the date is important, um, as well as the referral to the other two providers, the consulting provider and the mental health provider. It captures the patient information as well and whether or not they're enrolled in hospice. Next slide. Again here, this is where the first oral request is documented, very important. Next slide. I wanna say also that on the attending physician form, it also captures the medication that was prescribed. And for Hawaii, there's really only two that's been prescribed, DDMP2 and DDMA. Um, okay, telehealth update. Is there a poll next? Next slide. Yes, there is. Oh, there we go. 
Um, so one, one more poll for our audience. Um, telehealth can be used as a method of communication between the provider and patient for any of the component, components for our Care or Choice Act. True or false? Um, there you go. Take a couple of seconds, make your choice. Okay, let's see the results. Hey, let's look at the answer. The answer, next slide. As most most of you got correct. Yes, it is true. It's within the provider scope. Same as face to face. And Laura is going to describe more about what telehealth looks like here in Hawaii um, as it relates to post COVID and the OCOCA. Laura? Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, so, overall, going forward, um, you can anticipate many changes and refinements to reimbursement policies around telehealth. Um, and I would anticipate that mainly because now we have a strong patient demand for it due to COVID um, and the convenience of accessing a provider um, in Hawaii. Um, and also that we do recognize that our patient, our provider numbers are decreasing. So access is, is concerning, especially on the neighbor islands as providers retire or they leave Hawaii. Uh, and so I've yet to check uh, UH, University of Hawaii, um, report on the number of active providers in the state. Uh, the, so we anticipate telehealth to continue and expand. Uh, we plan to establish a telehealth council to um, fine tune some of the changes that may still be needed. I've been told that the governor's emergency proclamation that we anticipate adopting just about every change that was on that pro proclamation with a there's a few exceptions in terms of utilizing telehealth uh, through um, audio only. So that's, you know, phone calls and providers at this point in time can get reimbursed the same as a face-to-face -face engagement just by making a phone call. I believe that's going to go away in our existing definition of telehealth that doesn't include just phone calls. It needs to be an audio and video engagement. Um, originating sites, uh, we anticipate that there's not going to be an exclusion for patients that live in non-rural areas. I mean, majority of Hawaii, the whole state of Hawaii, we're in the middle of the ocean. We are rural. Uh, we'll just put it so um, we have places on Oahu that uh, it would be considered very rural. I'm, I'm in Waimanalo, so we're considered rural. <laughs> but so, you know, we anticipate originating sites and the requirements around um, doing telehealth to the patient's home to go away that 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 providers will be able to to do telehealth regardless of where the patient is located. Um, and then I've been working with broadband, uh, the Department of Business and Economic Development to help expand broadband in the state. Uh, you cannot do telehealth without internet connectivity. And so uh, we get to the nitty gritty in terms of laying cables and talking with providers about various areas on the island. And I do hear from the providers to say, hey, you know, I'm in Ka'u and uh, my, my internet connection is just spotty. I just cannot do telehealth. Um, but those things are going to change. We anticipate more funding. There is funding for, for broadband access and there's gonna be more funding for that. I will highlight though, the bigger picture around broadband is that our cables are aging. Uh, cables that actually connect us to the, uh, the continent are aging. Uh, they last about 25 years or so and just about every one of them are about that time period in terms of the, the cable aging. And we have new cables being laid out, but they're bypassing Hawaii. So we do need funding for new cables to connect Hawaii to the rest of the world. And that's something that we're working on um, at the state and with many in the community. Um, in terms of 
bridging the digital equity gaps. COVID really highlighted, um, you know, residents uh, and residents that don't have a computer, that don't use computers. And so uh, there are efforts in the community to help train folks with the basic skills around turning on a computer, how to do email and things like that. So there is work, um, uh, ongoing work that will help um, patients get upskilled so that they have the tools to um, uh, connect with the rest of the world. Because if we don't address equity gaps in, in terms of digital equity gaps, uh, folks may be left behind because we do see um, our, our world is much more connected and we need to um, help people get up to speed and upskill to utilize uh, the computer. Uh, and I believe that's the last slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our next slide, um, telehealth in action. I, I would ask Dr. Sharfin, could you talk a little bit about telehealth and how you might use it or are using it on the neighbor islands? Sure, yeah, I, and I do touch on this a little bit later, but I will say probably one of the best things I think that came out of COVID is the use of telehealth. Um, I have now helped six patients on the Big Island go through the process of the Our Care, Our Choice Act. Five of those I did via telehealth um, because the patients are located all over the island. I live up at the very northern point and I've helped pay people in Pune. So that's a two and a half hour drive. Um, for either myself or the patient. So that's a big plus in, in expanding access. Um, I also believe there is a connection that happens that I wasn't really expecting to happen with telehealth. I was a little bit skeptical when I first started using it specifically for the Our Care, Our Choice Act. Um, this is a very intimate um, thing you're doing with a patient. And I thought, oh gosh, I need to be in their presence. Actually, I think you can even have even deeper connections because there's some something that happens for the patient, I believe. They're in the comfort of their home. They're in a familiar setting and they tend to be able to open up maybe even a little bit deeper. So um, my experience with telehealth has been nothing but positive, except when a patient doesn't have very good connection. I mean, that is, that is the, the downfall, I guess. And I've only had that happen so far with one. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharpen. Um, next slide. So there are a few other considerations as we think about um, participating with our Care Our Choice Act. And Dr. Miller, if you could help us um, talk a little bit more about the liability and professional pro um, protections. Can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, you're muted. There we go. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> we talked a little bit about this before. Um, the no provider uh, license in the state of Hawaii, or for that matter, any other jurisdiction, uh, can be required to participate in the aid and dying laws. And as long as the provider follows the requirements of the Our Care, Our Choice Act, uh, there is no liability. And there's never been any disciplinary action taken, uh, taken against uh, a physician or actually I think any other provider um, by any state medical boards anywhere in the country for either participating or declining to participate with medical aid and dying. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Next, yeah, there we go. Um, <clears throat> The other important thing, and, and I think was touched a little bit earlier, uh, this, uh, the, the, the patient's request uh, cannot change their health or life insurance status, or for that matter of fact, any other legal or medical contracts, uh, which I think uh, Laura mentioned before, the cause of death uh, has to be the underlying illness. And again, medical aid in dying does not constitute suicide, mercy killing, homicide, anything else. There's a dramatic slide that I, I don't have in here, but the difference between suicide and aid in dying is, is dramatic. People who commit suicide don't want to live. People who request aid in dying want to live the, they really do, but they can't, and they recognize that. And so 
their option is to take control and end their life the way they want to. Next slide. And death certificate is obviously legal and medical issues, but the cause of death, as I said earlier, is the underlying illness. For instance, if a patient has amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, that's the diagnosis after they take aid and dying. Or if they have prostate cancer, that's the diagnosis after they take aid and dying to end their life. Um, and uh, the manner of death is considered natural. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Miller. We are next going to hear from Dr. Sharfin as our independent doctor um, on the Big Island, but I just wanted to also remind you, please send us any questions that you might have. We will be having a question and answer section at the end of the presentation. Um, so we are really willing and able and interested in answering any of your questions. So please feel free to drop um, your question into the chat. We will move it actually to our documents so that we can see all of the questions and group them as in case they have um, similar themes. So don't be surprised if it shows up and then goes away, uh, but please add your question into the chat and we will um, answer it at the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Charlotte Sharfin from the Big Island and have her share with us um, her perspective on medical aid and dying. Thank you, Karen. So. Um, Yes, I am on the Big Island. I have been here for about five years. I'm a board certified emergency medicine physician. So I have a little bit of a different perspective. I've been working in emergency medicine now for 20 years. Um, but when I moved to the Big Island, I tell you, I, I really started to focus more on end of life care. It led me to start a nonprofit because I recognized within that world that we do a pretty poor, um, poor job educating our, educating our patients. And so I have a nonprofit called Life and Death Wellness, and our mission is to educate around all life matters, but especially the end. So that's really why I do this. This is why I get up and talk about this um, endlessly to anybody that will listen, because I think it helps us do end of life care better in general. I also think there's a lot of misinformation out there between patients and clinicians. And I think it's really important to have these kind of talks so we can dispel those, um, that misinformation that exists. And then identifying barriers is a big one for me, especially living on an outer island. I think we face a different set of barriers. There are barriers across the board, but there's other ones that we, um, that we have. And so how do we identify them and then either work around them or figure out how we can improve them? I don't do these talks to sway or convince anyone to participate in the law or not. That is such a personal choice but I think you first need to understand the law and be able to talk intelligently about it and then make that decision for yourself. Um, a lot of the patients that approach me, and I'm gonna tell you, they're not my, usually they're not my private patients. They have found me because they either do not have a provider that's willing to participate um, or they've just basically been shut down. And what I hear from all of them is they wanna die with dignity. They want that death with dignity law thing. That's how a lot of the, the patients come to me. And so, um, I think that's important to really recognize um, that dignity means something different from ev for, for everyone and, and really understanding the values of the patients and helping them um, helping them come to come to that. So next slide, because uh, I think this will next slide, please. Next slide. Uh oh. <laughs> I can keep talking, but <laughs> did we lose our slide? Uh, let's find out. Let's see. Sam? Sam or Christina? Sorry, everybody. Let me, it, it, everything shut down. Let me pull it up real quick. Okay. All right. Okay. So in the meantime, Dr. Sharfin, maybe I'll, you I'll, can continue. I'll, yeah, I'll just keep going. Um, the next slide is, um, they're basically comments that I've either been spoken to me or I have heard in, uh, in educational spaces or that have been said to my patients. And I would ask you, I'll just read them and you can decide for yourself whether you think those are dignified 
things to say to another human or not. And the first one says, go home and die naturally or take a bottle of basically it was Benadryl or diphenhydramine. Sounds like Kevorkian is back. I actually heard that in a talk from a urologist when Dr. Groob was giving um, a, a lecture. Do you believe in the Bible? Thou shall not kill. That was said to me by one of our legislatures when I was testifying, testifying in favor of amendments to our law. Um, I don't do this. I'm not allowed to do this. The hospital policy doesn't allow this. Our institution has a neutral sense, so we don't talk about it. That's not neutral, by the way changes the subject and doesn't even address the request. In my opinion, none of these things are dignified. And I hope when, we are, when we're talking in these kind, of, um, these kind of settings, we can make sure that how we speak to each other as clinicians and how we speak to our, our patients are dignified. Next, please. Next uh, slide. Um, I like this slide and Dr. Miller did touch on this a little bit, but when you, when you ask patients that go through medical aid and dying, in, in many states. These are the things you're gonna hear that are their end of life concerns. And I think it's a lot of patients end of life concerns, whether they go through the law or not, but this is specifically polling them. And it's really loss of autonomy and not being able to enjoy life and loss of dignity. Um, there are those other concerns. And as Dr. Miller pointed out, pain is not usually a big one um, because we do such a good job, I think in handling pain at the end of people's lives. Uh, next slide. But I do have a story that I want to share with you because this is Debbie and actually pain was uh, actually a lot higher on her list than most of the patients that I've experienced. Um, Debbie is, gosh, she's the last patient that I helped go through the entire process. And I will tell you that she had so much gratitude for every other patient that went before her on this island because she had heard their stories and she had known their struggles. Um, but she didn't struggle that, that much to get through this law. There were barriers and there were some things that I, you know, I wish had been done differently. But because I'd been working with this law for a few years now, I had, we had um, the ability to kind of get around those barriers. So she would tell you it wasn't hard to get through the process. And she would tell you that she was a really holistic type of person. She had breast cancer and she lived with it for over five years before it really became rampant throughout her body. She never chose um, to use chemo or radiation. She was pretty opposed actually to any kind of Western medication. And it took a lot for her to even accept hospice when it came time. The only reason that she did was because she knew one of the nurses within that hospice system. And that allowed her to step into the hospice. Um, she went through that hospice for about a year, feeling very supported, by the way. Her pain was well controlled, even though she didn't want to use a whole lot of, of pain medication. But as that started to escalate, she had a line. She had a line that she said, I don't want to, I don't want to cross this line. And she knew she was getting there. And that's when she reached out to me. And that was, that was in December of last year. She also was fully aware that her hospice on this island was not going to be able to support having their nurse there. That was, it was a policy that they had against it. And so she was fully aware of that and we were able to navigate that, right? Um, so she had me as her physician. Um, she didn't have any other physicians that she could ask to be consulting, but by then I had a group of people that I had been working with. So I was able to get her referred quickly. And so she was able to go through the process outside of her system within that 20 day period. She also accepted an end of life doula. So it became, um, she had a really nice team, a team that, you know, wasn't within a Kaiser system or a big system, but we built it because we are a community that cares about our patients and we can figure out how to do this even as independent providers. Um, for all of my patients, I do let them know that I will be present um, if they choose to access the medication. Now. Debbie lived down in Pune, so that was a two and a half hour drive for me. But when she chose that, I absolutely um, chose to be there as, as her end of life doula did. Um, you'll see the heart surrounding Debbie and the hearts and the grass. That's what I found when I pulled up to her driveway. There were orchids, which were her favorite flowers, scattered everywhere, hearts everywhere. She had her closest friends and her family's full support. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> when I walked into the space, um, her young daughter in her early 20s, when she saw me, she just burst out into tears. 
because she knew this was the day that her mother had chosen. And I cannot tell you um, how vibrant this woman was and how beautiful her life and her death was to be able to be a witness to it all and to be able to support it in a way that she may not have been able to get the support um, had she tried to do this just on her own with her family and friends. And so Debbie saw hearts everywhere in her life and she told us we would see them everywhere and after her death. And I will tell you, she had a very peaceful death. Um, she died in the arms of her daughter, surrounded by people that loved her. Uh, the next day I went for a nice long walk because it's intense to do this work. And um, I chose this one spot to sit down. And as soon as I looked down, there were those four hearts that you see right at my feet. So I think Debbie um, exemplifies a really beautiful story of what we can do as independent providers and what we can do on, out, on the outer islands um, when we don't always have all the access that we love to have. So I'll be talking about the other patients that didn't really have these kind of opportunities, but um, I felt like we should start off with a positive story. So next slide. One of the other things I'll tell you that brought me, um, that got me interested in the law actually before we ever even had it in Hawaii was the data out of Oregon. Oregon having the law the longest, they had collected a large amount of data and, um, and it was actually published, I think in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017. And I was overwhelmed with what I read. And I was really super excited when, when the law and that was enacted in Hawaii because I felt like we were gonna start to see the same benefits that Oregon did. And that is that end of life care overall improves when we have a law like this that is implemented. And that's because it, it starts to make doctors talk to their patients and patients talk to their doctor. There's an increase in dialogue. So if you look at Oregon's data, hospice referrals went up, palliative, excuse me, palliative care referrals went up. Um, Oregon has the lowest rate of in hospital deaths as opposed to any other state in the country and violent suicide among hospice patients pretty much disappeared after they enacted this law. Next slide. Um, and this, this is that journal article that I read and you guys should look it up if you have a chance. But, but so what I was hopeful was that we were gonna start to see some of those changes in Hawaii. And I think little by little we will. Next slide. So I do wanna to talk to you all about what I've learned as an independent provider in the state of Hawaii and specifically on Hawaii Island. And there is the good and there is the bad. And unfortunately there is a little bit of the ugly. And I think we need to talk about all of it. So next slide. Next slide. Um, and we've touched on this, so I won't spend too much more time. So the good, I do believe, is to, one of the great things I think that's come out of, unfortunately, COVID is the telemedicine aspect, the connection that you can have with the patients. Um, and uh, the other good I want to point out is that connection that I have with every patient that I've taken through that process. There is a deeper connection, not just virtually, right? There is something that happens between a doctor and a physician that I think is super important. Next slide. There is a part of the process that I think is also good um, that's written into our law that I wanna point out because I'm gonna point out some things that I don't think is so great, but that is what Dr. Miller also touched on is the person has to be fu fully informed. They have to know what all of their end of life options are. And so the doctor has to check that box off and so does the patient. And I think that's super important because what that does is again, it increases conversation around all end of life options. And of course the patient can always withdraw their request. They're not, um, thank you. Okay, so the bad, and I call those the barriers. And there are several that are inherent to the law. And there are just several just that happen all over, but especially on an outer island. So I'm gonna talk about the process and the medication a little bit more in detail, but some of the other barriers, the patient. Yes, the patient can be a barrier when they are not educated. Um, and so it is super important that we do that. The physician, the physician is a barrier when they don't participate. And we can see that on outer islands. We don't have a lot of participating physicians. Um, physicians can also be a barrier when they don't educate themselves. So I commend any of you that are here um, to get yourself educated, even if you choose not to participate. Hospices can be a barrier or not. Um, you know, on an outer island like ours, we don't have the luxury. Patients don't get the choice of what hospice they go into. It's based on where they live. So we have three hospices, the North, the East, and the West. 
Um, and depending on what hospice you fall into depends on whether they are going to support the law or not. I am very fortunate. I live in North Hawaii. They're fully supportive. They allow their nurses to be present with the patient. They allow their nurses to talk and educate, which is super important in my opinion. Can the hospital system be a barrier? It can, because a lot of these requests, at least some of the first ones may be to the ER doctor. Uh, they may be to the hospitalist. And if the hospital system has not put a policy in place or they put a negative policy in place, then it can be a barrier. And we'll talk about that too. Um, on outer islands, pharmacy is a big barrier. Uh, initially when the law went into um, effect, we had no compounding pharmacy that was willing at all to compound the medication. So all of my patients had to get their medication from Oahu. So you take a 20 day process and you turn it into a minimum of 25 to 30 days just by the time they get their meds. That has changed. It is changing. So that's a positive. Financially, um, unfortunately, if a physician is not participating that takes that person's insurance, it can be a financial burden to, to a patient. And then the actual act of going through not just the process, but taking the medication. This is super important why I do believe hospices can be so valuable, end of life doulas can be so valuable. It's not just taking a simple pill. That's what a lot of my patients think. There is a process and it, unless there's some education around it, it can be a barrier. Um, next slide. Okay, so more about the process, because <laughs> as you can see, it's really detailed. I think the Department of Health makes it a lot more, a lot easier. So I would highly recommend looking at, at their website, but this is just a flow sheet from Samaritan Health. And I think for a lot of independent providers, if you look at this, it's a bit overwhelming. It can be a bit daunting if you don't have a navigator and you've never done this before, but it's not impossible. But I do want to, um, I want to highlight a story and I call him the captain because I think he got caught in the process and the barriers that are important to highlight. This was a patient that had a terminal cancer on the west side of the island. He had an oncologist. His, uh, his cancer was progressing quite rapidly. He uh, finally approached his physician, unfortunately, towards the end of his disease and said, I'm really interested in this, in this um, law. Can you help me? And the physician said, I am fully in support of helping you. Let me find out. I don't know. I don't know if our hospital has a policy. And unfortunately, he was told that he was not allowed to participate under the hospital's policy as either the attending or the consulting provider. And in fact, that actually wasn't true. Uh, this, whoever the administrator was at the time didn't understand there was actually no policy. And that's how he ended up finding me, unfortunately, because he kept getting all these stops along the way. And I think it was through compassion choices, not actually through the hospital that I'm affiliated with. And so when I took on the case, I got his, I did his first oral request as soon as I actually got the request. And I will tell you, I was, I was concerned from the very beginning that he wasn't going to make it through the process. He looked, um, he just didn't look like he was going to make it. And I'll never forget him saying to me, so doctor, what you're telling me is I just have to stay alive and I have to stay sane in order to get this medication. And I said, yeah, basically. And this was super important to him, um, probably on a level that I, I couldn't even understand. This was that, that control, that like just sense of peace that he could get from this medication. And so unfortunately though, here was a hospital that had kind of put a block to that. Now he's got to start his, start his day one with me. Um, day 20 came around and he was still alive. And I will never forget that day um, because I didn't think he was going to make it. And we literally high-fived through the teleprompter and I wrote his prescription. And then he fell, hit his head and died of complications of his disease. And the last words he said to his wife, some of the last words I was told was that what is today and when will I get my medicine? So it was super important to him. And it just shows you how a hospital system, if they don't understand their policies or if they don't have one, how it can be a hindrance. Now, the beautiful part about this story is this hospital listened. They heard me, they heard this patient's story and they said, this was not acceptable. And not only do they have a, a, a policy in place that is um, engaged and neutral, they have spent time and effort educating their physicians. They have started a, a committee to help around all end of life care for their, um, 
for their patients, but also for the people that work there. So the captain, even though it was a bad experience to some extent, he really did change. He really did change things on our island. And so I'm very grateful for him. Next slide. And this is just still part of the process. I, I'm not gonna go through all of this, just to point out the barriers, the potential barriers. And this is why I thought the amendments were so extremely important. It's because it has to be two Hawaii physicians. I am in full support of having advanced nurse practitioners be, um, be el being eligible to play the attending and consulting role. I think especially for outer islands, that will decrease the barrier. And I hope one day we get there. Same thing, we didn't, you know, the amendments didn't address this, but I like to point this out as a potential barrier because it has been for some of my patients. It's, it has slowed them is having to have a mental health evaluation. We are the only state that requires that. So that's definitely a barrier. Um, and there's just really at this point, no way of getting around that one. Next slide. And then the other barrier that I think about is that 20 day waiting period. Like you just saw with the captain, had it been 15 days, he would have made it through. Had I been given the ability to waive that waiting period, he would have been able to have made it through. He was the first patient I, I truly said, oh my God, I wish, this, I wish this amendment would go through so I don't have to experience this and his family doesn't have to experience this again. Next slide. Um, I wanna touch on the medications, one for education purposes, but the other is because this can be a barrier. It, it you know, just, just because the type and the dosage ch can change, this is um, it's not set in stone and it's changed over many years. It's already changed twice since I've, I've been participating, um, but it is a compound of medicine. A lot of your patients are gonna think it's a pill. It's a pill that they can take and then that will hasten their death very quickly. But it is a, it's medication that comes in two separate bottles. And so understanding what it is, but also how you counsel them about around it. But if self-administered, um, most patients do fall asleep within 10 to 20 minutes. All of my patients that I have been witness to, it's been less than 10. And um, then most typically will die in one to two hours. I have had one patient go outside that, but we were prepared because we knew that that, that she had a very strong heart. And that may, be, that may be a possibility, but understanding that as a possibility as a provider is super important. Next slide. So this is really the standard of care now. Um, this is what's called the D-DMA. Um, and it, again, it is a compounded medication and uh, it will come from a compounded pharmacy. They're gonna get basically the Zofran and the Metoclopram, um, the Reglan and a separate, it's a pre-medication, but then two bottles. The DIG will be in the first bottle and then you'll have the diazepam, the morphine and the amitriptyline uh, in the second. Uh, it used to be propranolol that came in that second bottle, um, but they have shifted more towards amitriptyline. The data shows that people are going to typically die quicker with this. Um, the DIG and the amitriptyline is basically there to stop the heart. Okay, just understand, understand that. And then of course the diazepam and the, the morphine are there to put the patient to sleep. Really super important for the patient to be NPO. That's a hard one um, for me, but I, I understand it now because I think, God, it's their last day. They should be able to eat whatever they want, but really and truly it can slow absorption. So it's really important to make sure that the patient understands that. Uh, next slide. And this is something that as clinicians, uh, we all need to know, this is another place where I think hospice can play a really big role um, if they're allowed to, is because there are red flags. And, and when the patient goes through the process, they may not have these red flags. They may have made their 20 days, they've qualified, they get their medicines, or they either at least have access to their medicines. But we know somebody at the end of their life, their disease can shift very rapidly. And that's why I think it is super important not only to understand the red flags, but to make sure, especially I think it's a great reason to be in hospice is because you want eyes on that patient. If they're going to choose to use the medication, you want to make sure that they haven't developed gastroparesis or because now they're so malnourished from their disease or have a bowel obstruction or at least be able to counsel them on that. Um, also understanding that people that are young, um, their hearts their hearts work, they, heart, they work well. And so they may fall outside of our expected time to death and being able to counsel family on that is super important and who to call if it does fall outside that expected time. That can actually shift a beautiful experience into a panicked experience if, if the family thinks they've done something wrong, right? Uh, 
And of course, if somebody's obese or uses a lot of alcohol or has a very, very high tolerance to opioids or benzos simply because of their disease, that they could um, end up being a red flag for, for the medication. Oh, the ugly. And um, I'm happy to say I've only seen one ugly, but I do want to bring this up. And this is what I call my Dr. Benadryl case. And this happened last fall. Um, I got a phone call from uh, Samantha Trad from Compassion and Choices, and I don't get those often. And uh, she basically said, Dr. Sharfin, I have a case. Can you please help this young, this man that's on your island? Um, he has basically gone through the whole process, or he thought he had gone through the whole process. His doctor, the way he understood it, had um, basically said he was going to help him with his terminal diagnosis. He made it clear that he wanted to access, he called it the death with dignity law. Um, and so he gave his first oral request. This man had done a lot of research. So he had gotten his, he got his consulting physician on his own, not on the right forms, but he did that work. He got his mental health provider, um, didn't fill out the right forms, but he did that work and went back on day 20 to make what he thought was his second oral request. And his primary care physician that had known him for a very long time got really thrown off is what I'm guessing and said, oh, no, 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 I, I don't do that. And if you want to die, you need to either go home and die naturally or take a bottle of Benadryl. That will stop your heart. Now, first of all, that's a, I think we can all agree that's not something you'd ever want to say to a patient. But even worse, when I actually spoke with that patient, next slide, whose name is Gary, um, the saddest part to me was, well, one, the, the, the actual insensitivity, but two was Gary really thought that might work. And that was his question to me. <laughs> Is that all I have to do? And so I had to sit there and counsel Gary. Um, I, no, Gary, I'm an emergency physician. You don't know how many overdoses I've seen on Benadryl. One, you probably won't die, but two, it will be a terrible experience for you and your family, the psychosis and all the complications that go along with that. So um, that ugly did eventually turn into something beautiful for Gary. I will say that um, once he got fully supported uh, with two end of life doulas and myself. And he had actually a great consulting physician and a great mental health provider. They just didn't know the right forms. They just hadn't had that little bit of education. Unfortunately, it took him over 40 days before he finally made it through that whole process. But he did, and he became a very outspoken advocate. Um, he wrote to our, our legislatures. You can read stories about him in the local paper. Um, and he was the first patient that I was with that actually ingested medication. He wanted me to be there um, along with his doulas and his family. And he died very peacefully, exactly the way he wanted. Um, and he was a father, he was a provider, he was a good friend and he loved being called, uh, he was of Cherokee descent and that was super important to him. Um, next slide. One thing that Gary said to us uh, that we're there with him, he told us he was gonna communicate with us through the clouds, he said, I don't know what's out there, but I have a feeling I'm going to be able to let you guys know I'm around at times. He goes, just look to the clouds. That's where you're going to see me. And uh, this picture was sent to me by one of his end of life doulas. It was taken one week to almost exactly the time of his death. And you can see that heart in those gray clouds. And that's kind of how I remember Gary. He had a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of ugliness around what he was trying to accomplish. But in the end, he ended up being this beautiful shining light for a lot of other people. So if you guys don't know BJ Miller, I'd sincerely tell you to look him up. He's a wonderful mm -hmm. palliative care physician, but this is one of his quotes. And he says, in end of life care, there is no place for language that causes fear, anxiety, guilt, or shame. And I fully agree with that. Thank you. Next slide, I think is Dr. Miller's. Actually, we're, I think we've talked about this one, but okay. um, yep. I, if you could talk to this one, um, Dr. Sharfin. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. So I think this is, this is important for any provider, whether you're in a big system or not, but especially for the independent provider. Um, when I started this, I had nobody. I really, I was it. I was actually the first doctor on an outside island or an, um, a neighbor island to write a prescription. So I turned to Compassion and Choices. They had a doc to doc line. And I'll tell you, unfortunately, Dr. Groob, he's testifying, but that was my mentor to start. And I've had now several because you need somebody that you can ask. You need somebody that you can kind of bounce these things off of. So I think there's really, and I'm here for anybody. If anybody has questions, I'm happy to be, a, to play a role in that too. Um, but you need your, you need, you need your, 
your community around you too. I was a little bit nervous the first time I got asked. I'm like, God, am I, are my colleagues going to think I'm a terrible whatever? There is a group of people on this island that are in full support that are colleagues. And it is important to have that professional support around you. And I do want to say hospice is super important. Um, my patients all benefit from hospice, whether they are involved actively in the law or not. I think it is important to try to at least get your patient um, to consider it and to really talk with those hospice nurses. Those are the ones that really are your eyes and ears and, and they are a huge part of the team if they're allowed to be. Um, and of course there's compassionchoices.org. Uh, that is where I send a lot of people. There's a lot of amazing information and the Department of Health. Their website also has a lot of great information. And before we um, go off of this slide, Dr. Miller, any other comments about the role of mentoring and professional support from your perspective and your experience? Yeah, I, I think, you know, Dr. Sharfin has hit the nail on the head. The, the best thing that I've seen happen is that over this period of two years, all of the oncologists in the Kaiser system have become very supportive, uh, certainly in terms of being happy to serve as the attending physician for their own patients, and also to cover um, for another oncologist, one of the partner's patients, if I'm not available to serve as the attending. So, that sort of, of mentoring, and it just takes time. And it's taken us two years to get to that point. And I think uh, the same thing is true in the HPH system. It, 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 more and more doctors are willing to, to write prescriptions. Great, thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. So we've heard some stories um, and I will just ask Dr. Sharpen or Dr. Miller, any other experiences you'd like to share with our audience before we go to Q and A? I will, go ahead, go ahead Dr. Miller. There, I've been talking a there, lot. <laughs> there are so many, I, I don't want to uh, even, I'm not Get sure. One. What, I, think, <laughs> I think the, uh, I think the, message, the learning, the experience that I've gotten out of doing this is the, the experience of, show, of sharing with the patient and their family a death that is peaceful and is what they wanted. It's how they wanted to leave this life. And um, I think I'm a better physician for having that experience. Great. Um, and Laura, any other comments you have at this point? Um, I really appreciate the sharing of the stories. It helps me to have an idea of the provider's perspective and their engagement with the community. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Um, next slide. So these are the um, Compassion and Choices resources that are available. Um, if anyone is interested in um, learning more about the RKR Choice Act, uh, including obviously the Department of Health website, you can always go to compassionandchoices.org. There are videos and, um, for doctors and patients, clinical criteria, just a wealth of information. Um, and But I'm going to move on to our Q&As that have um, come in. Uh, as we've had the presentation today. So please um, presenters all unmute yourself because I think each of you have a question or two out here. Um, so first of all, Laura, a question has come in. Has the Department of Health published a policy regarding allowing the first oral request to be made to a physician who does not serve as the attending and write the prescription? It's important for the healthcare systems to know and to follow. Can you speak to that a little bit? I think you mentioned it, but. Um... Right, I, I, to be honest, I don't recall this discussion happening within the board. Um, and so I had this question posed to our deputy AG to you know, reevaluate the Our Care, Our Choice Act. And she 
indicated that there's no law that specifically prevents um, patients from going to one provider and getting referred to a provider, another provider that's going to actually serve as the attending provider. What's more important is that the oral request is documented. And so it will require, um, and this is similar common practice from what I'm gathering with providers. It's not uncommon for providers to go on vacation or leave the island and then they have to um, refer the patient to another provider. So this is something similar in, in terms of common practice with between providers. And so, um, you know, in a nutshell, there's nothing that prevents providers from accepting the first oral request and then referring the patient to a provider who will participate in the Our Care, Our Choice Act. Um, if there are materials that are needed or changes that are needed to help the systems make this change, because I do think that it's not a our care, our choice legal change, it's just a process change and a new look in terms of the perspective of how we looked at the law previously. But I don't recall this conversation ever coming up in the board. So it's a good find, I think. Great, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Miller, how do the Kaiser physicians initiate medical aid in dying with end of life support at Kaiser? How do they initiate with, with what? How do the Kaiser physicians initiate med medical aid in dying within the end of life support systems that were already there? Normally, the commonest event is uh, the the specialist, an oncologist, a pulmonologist, or a cardiac uh, specialist who is taking care of a patient who clearly is approaching their end of life, um, will make a referral to our navigators who will review the chart, talk with the patient, and they basically, I mean, they make they, it's obvious that they, they see, yes, this patient is eligible and refer the patient to me for the first verbal request. And that's why I put that question out to Laura because uh, the lawyers in the Kaiser system uh, have not, have said that we can't start the process the clock ticking, the day 20 day clock ticking until they actually talk to me rather than taking the request from the first provider. And that's why I, that's why I think the, the Department of Health needs to put out some guidance for the systems and the lawyers so that uh, we can get this done better. That's great. Thank you very much for all that feedback. That's wonderful. Dr. Sharfin, if you don't have a nurse navigator, who do you use to help coordinate the medical aid and dying process? Sure. So um, that's a great question because as an independent provider, I'm, you know, I'm a very small practice. I, I, it's me really. And I have, a, I have a virtual assistant and then I have end of life doulas that do help support me. So um, I think what can happen, I've created my own system. So um, I, I really I, I am in charge when it comes to being the attending provider. I like, because I don't do that many, right? It's not like this is, you're gonna be running through these all day during a clinic. This may, again, two years, I've had six patients go through the process. And once you've done it once, I think it makes a lot more sense, but your staff in your office, if you have a, a trusted staff can absolutely help you navigate that and make sure, you know, because the Department of Health does do such a good job giving you that outline and those check boxes. You know, making sure you're following those through. I mean, my virtual assistant, we set up a system within my EMR, um, right? I am actually, through my nonprofit, one of the things we're planning on doing is really training end-of-life doulas. So I have brought end-of-life doulas along with me each time a patient has asked for me to be there when they take that medication, because I feel like I'm not always going to be around to do that in person. And I do, until we have more support on an outer island, I think end of life doulas can play that role in being supportive, but they have to be well trained in that because this is so much of a, a little bit different of a specialty when it comes to that. 
So if you have end of life doulas that you trust, um, which I am fortunate, I have several in my community because I help train them. Um, that that's another way. Um, and then, you know, your nurses, your APRNs, there's a lot of people that have said, God, I'd love to help. How can I help? So pull from your community. You'll be really surprised as to how many people really want to make this not so tough for people that want to access the law in general. That's great. And on that note, I will wrap up today. It's been a wonderful webinar. A special thank you to our three presenters, Dr. Sharfin, Laura Arcibald, and Dr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for pinch hitting for Dr. Guru. Uh, <laughs> I, had, I understand he's actually testifying um, in front of Nevada uh, legislature instead of Oregon. So that's where he is. Uh, but again, thank you so much. I really appreciate all the people that participated and thank you all, um, all of you attendees. Um, just remember, please complete the evaluation form. Um, and that's the way that your continuing education credits will come through. And we obviously are always looking for more feedback um, on how to do our webinars better. And for the presenters, we're going to do a little debrief afterwards. Um, so uh, we'll reconnect shortly. Um, and other than that, have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon. Thank you all for attending. Goodbye. Aloha. 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 <laughs>